So now, what we're going to start with on this chapter is looking at the definitions of deviance and crime, what they are, and then we're going to look at the theories. How do each of the theoretical groups look at some of these issues? In this one, we're going to look at some of the, 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 their theoretical perspectives. They have theories of their own, and I'm going to review them kind of quickly. You'll find them all in your textbook, and I hope you find this very helpful and enjoyable, and hopefully you don't uh, you haven't had any experience with uh, criminal activity that you could probably speak to this more <laughs> intelligently than maybe I will. So let's get on with this. All societies have norms to reinforce and help teach acceptable behavior. Now, deviance, this is any behavior, belief, or condition that violates cultural norms. Now, I'm going to point it out here now, and I'll bring it up later. It's relative. Deviance is relative. Now, an act only becomes deviant when it is society's, uh, what society defines as such. So, the, you know, each society defines deviance differently, and their lines about what is deviant and what is not vary from society to society. Definitions of deviance are very widely from place to place, from time to time, and from group to group. Violations are dealt with through a various mechanisms of social control. And that's another key word that we use in, in deviance and, and crime. Social control is systematic practices developed by social groups to encourage conformity. Control can involve socialization, or it could be using negative sanctions. And the most extreme negative sanction would be uh, prison. Now, deviance, I mentioned it's relative. Deviance is relative. It's an, a, an act becomes deviant when it is socially defined as such. You know, you could argue, and some people have, that my wearing shorts in the wintertime is deviant. Well, it doesn't breach all people's social norms. Um, there's not a law. There's not someone that, you know, comes around and says, I'm sorry, Steve, but uh, it seems you breach a norm. We need you to ask you to go home and put some pants on. However, there are other behaviors that are. And one of the examples I've used when you talk about deviance is um, if you're at a, 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 a hockey game, a football game, a baseball game, this is going back a few years when this happened a lot, is the wave. You know, whoa! When that happened, everybody would engage. And in that environment, it was socially acceptable. Now, you put that same behavior and you put it into a church, and let's say you decide that the, the priest, the minister, the speaker has said something profound that you really enjoyed, and you went, whoa! Chances are that would be viewed as deviant. So it's relative in terms of place, time, location, group. And so it's important to note that. Some examples in terms of deviance, in terms of crime and deviance, members of a gang may shun mainstream conformity yet conform to a group's code or dress. Deviance is also ambiguous. Deviance is good and bad, has good and bad definitions, so um, they vary so much that sometimes it's difficult to consider what is deviance and what is not. And deviance varies with degrees. It ranges from mild transgressions of folkways, folkways being um, uh, my wearing shorts, or mores, which is more sexual overtones, to more serious infringements based on law, things like rape. Now, it can be understood to mean, and not only the behavior, but also beliefs. Some forms of deviant behavior are officially defined as crimes. Behaviors that violate criminal law and are punishable by fines, jail terms, and other sanctions, that's what we're going to look like look at in more of part two of this uh, chapter. So it's important. Social control are the things that we Im impose on people for breaching social norms that aren't just mildly deviant, but in fact cross the line where social control needs to be put in place. Fines, jail terms, and other sanctions can be those um, consequences uh, for breaching criminal behavior.
Okay, let's get looking at the different theorists. And we're going to start with functionalists. Now, functionalists have a couple, three theories that we're going to touch on. Functionalists use strain theory, opportunity theory, and social bonding theory to argue that socialization into the core values of material success without the corresponding legitimate means to achieve the goal, which accounts for such crimes committed by people you know, of lower income background, especially when the person's um, ties to society are weakened or broken. Now, what's important about that entry opening there was that it's socialized. And so it has a lot to do with who you look to in your peer group for what you learn about what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And so because you don't, and I mentioned in that opening, without corresponding legitimate means. And you'll see what that kind of means is if I'm living in a low income and among a bunch of young males, and I see commercials about what everyone else is able to access, but I can't access it the same way they can, I don't have the money to give to buy that car, then I might learn through the socialization of the people that I associate with and who I look up to that stealing that car is acceptable behavior. So let's look at each of these theories. We'll start with strain theory. Let's look at strain theory, the goals and means to achieve them. So according to strain theory, this is done by Merton, people feel strain when they are exposed to cultural, cultural goals that they are un unable to obtain because they don't have access to culturally approved means to achieve these goals. So they feel strain when they see all the images out there, the advertising, they see other people with things that they want, but they don't have the way to achieve them. So that strain is what motivates them to achieve them through other means. So the subsequent rec um, reduction, for example, of Canadian taxes and the increase in costs of cigarettes dramatically cut the incidences of cigarette smuggling. But the networks and expertise developed by the smugglers well, that remains, so they just turn to new commodities. They turn to drugs, alcohol, firearms. So that's one of the ways through strain theory to, you know, to affect how many people in a lower class might turn to criminal activity. Now, strain theory also explains upper class deviance. Excuse me. There's pressure to increase corporate pro uh, profits. You know, you could argue, um, you know, uh, Bell and, and Rogers felt the pressure to increase corporate uh, profits where it gets difficult to determine, um, to, to explain the increase in the charges for your internet, for your cable, that if you complain, you can get them to lower it. But if they could have lowered it, why do I have to complain? It's because there's a great pressure to be the number one best provider and to have corporate profits increased, that there will be increases that don't seem to be justified. And so strain theory could be used to explain that. Let's carry on with um, looking at opportunity theory, and this is still under functionalism. Now opportunity theory, access to legitimate opportunity. For deviance to occur, people must have access to illegitimate opportunity structures. This is circumstances that people, uh, that provide opportunity for people to acquire through illegitimate activities that they could not achieve through legitimate channels. Now, opportunity just really means having access to the people who can give you information on how to access these things illegally. And so in some neighborhoods in Toronto, Danzig, uh, uh, Regent Park, the young kids would be growing up among older kids who had access to many of these things illegitimately and would give access to the younger kids to these same means or same channels if you will and so that has a big impact you know you know that um, the illegitimate opportunities are available and the structure that you live in give you access to them that's your opportunity 
Now, lastly in functionalism is known as control theory or social bonding. And this holds that the probability of deviant behavior increases when a person's ties to society are weakened or broken. Now, if you remember from very early on in our course, we looked at um, Anomi. Uh, Emile Durkheim was explaining suicide by the disconnect people start to feel from one another in cities. And that's what he used the term anomi, this disconnect, to explain suicide. So control theory is basically working from that same foundation that the more people feel disconnected or broken from society, it increases the probability of exploring deviant behavior. So some of the themes in control theory. Deviant behavior is minimized when people have strong bonds that bind them to families, peers, religious organizations, and other institutions. So according to a Hershey, uh, author of this uh, social bonding, social bonding consists of four things. That you can increase your social bonding by having attachment to other people, commitment to conventional behavior, um, involvement in conventional activities, and belief in legitimate, the legitimacy of conventional values and norms. So the point on this is, the point on this is with having those four things enables you to better um, connect with social groups and therefore reduce the like of deviant and criminal behavior. Now we'll look at next symbolic interactionalists. Symbolic interactionalists use differential association theory and labeling theory to explain how a person's behavior is influenced and reinforced by others. According to interactionalists, deviance is learned in the same way as conformity through the interaction with others and through socialization. So when we consider differential association theory, where it states that individuals have a greater tendency to deviate from social norms when they frequently associate with persons who favor deviance over conformity. And really, that just makes a lot of sense. If I associate with people who do criminal activity, the likelihood is I'll start to do more of that criminal activity. So people learn the necessary techniques and the motives, the drives, and the rationalizations and the attitudes of deviant behavior from people whom they associate with. It's one of the arguments for why people going into prison don't necessarily all come out uh, reformed. They become associated with other people and learn new skills and rationalizations and motives behind doing other criminal behavior. Now, people are more likely to engage in criminal activity if they are frequent, intense, and long-lasting interactions with others who violate the law. So the odd popping in and out of social groups that have that activity is not likely to have a profound impact on everybody. Long-lasting, intense, um, and frequent. Now, ties to other deviants are especially important to the world of organized crime, where the willingness of peers to stand up for one another and, uh, can be very critical in maintaining power in the face of violent opposition and competitors. Now, the other symbolic interactionalist theory is what's known as label, labeling theory. And this suggests that deviants are those people who have been successfully labeled as such by others. Now, you have to remember, so you know, the, uh, the symbolic interactionalists are the face-to-face -face micro level theory. The other theorists are more macro, global. So by looking at it social interactionally, you're looking at the face-to-face -face relationships that people have with one another. And so when I've been labeled by others as being deviant and criminal, that's where the labeling theory comes in. That's where it says, you know, successfully labeled by others. The process of labeling is directly related to the power and the status of those persons who do the labeling. Thus, who are being labeled and those who are being labeled. So, I mean, if I'm, for example, 
I dress in a way that looks criminal and police have said I've been arrested or I am being arrested, then those around me will start to see this as being an appropriate way to label me. Now, we can look at labeling in two different types of deviance. First is primary deviance, and this is the initial act um, of rule breaking. This is your first offense or first level of activity of deviance. That's primary. Now, secondary deviance, this occurs when a person who's been labeled as deviant accepts the new identity and continues the deviant behavior. So there's the two levels. First getting labeled, first breaking the rule. Now, if you've learned from that and you move on and you don't do that again, then that's the extent and you're not likely labeled. However, if that's your first event and your first experience and then you get back involved with these same people and you continue with other behaviors that fit that same group and you identify with it and you continue that behavior, then that's secondary deviance. Now within this group of symbolic interactionalists are moral entrepreneurs. People who use their own views of right and wrong to establish rules and label others as deviant. And we've seen this in our own society quite a lot. Uh, moral entrepreneurs are often moral crusades, public and media awareness campaigns that help to generate public and political support for their causes. Now, one of the ones you probably are most familiar with is Mothers Against Drunk Driving. But it's also been much earlier in our history than that, the women's temperance movement of the early 20th century that resulted in prohibition, campaigns against abortion, prostitution, child abuse. Back in 2003, the example of the Roman Catholic Church, the um, evangelical, Muslim, and Sikh leaders united against same-sex marriages. And so these are examples of the moral entrepreneurship. Now, stigmatizing labels can last a long time and make it difficult for labeled persons to reintegrate into society. Many of the provisions of the Youth Criminal Justice Act were enacted to reduce the impact of labeling of young offenders. Uh, it's very common for people to, re to, to leave after long stays in prison and find it very difficult to get reintegrated back into society and find themselves reoffending uh, to, to go back to what they're familiar with and where they are accepted. So now let's look at conflict theory. <clears throat> Now, conflict theory, you can barely, you can sort of ask the question, who has the power to define, enforce, and punish crime and deviance? Well, conflict theorists suggest that people with the economic and political power define as ec uh, criminal and behavior anything, any behavior that threatens their own interests. The powerful then use law to protect their interest as well as control those who are without the power. The way that laws are made and enforced benefit the capitalist class by ensuring that individuals at the bottom of the social class uh, structure do not infringe on the property or threaten the safety of those at the top. Now remember, conflict theory is looking at the difference between the bourgeois and the proletariat, the rich and the workers. So some of the elements involved here, the marginalized commit crime in order to survive, and not, but not to become rich. Frequently, in the struggle for survival, marginalized persons victimize other marginalized people through things like violent gang activity, uh, many, um, to many, maybe a, a collective response to, of young people to, to seamlessly hopeless uh, poverty. The law protects the interests of the affluent and the powerful and are not, as is claimed, the common good. According to conflict theorists, the affluent commit crimes because they are greedy and want more than they have. The poor commit crimes in order to survive. <clears throat> Excuse me. So living in poverty may lead to violent crimes and victimization by the poor, of the poor by the poor. Now, related to conflict is feminist theories. 
And in this, you know, in this theory group, evidence is that women, women's crime rates increase with women's liberation movement. Now, some of the theories are, are wrapping around women deviance in crime as a rational response to oppression and, and discrimination. And where this is paramount to their, their cause is patriarchy. Patriarchy, male-driven uh, societies, keeps women's, women tied to the family and home. So some of the examples of crime that is a result of patriarchy is prostitution. Women are more likely to be charged than the Johns. Women are exploited by capitalism and patriarchy because more women than men have low-paying jobs. Women tend to become involved in prostitution and shoplifting. There's new links now between race, class, and gender. Frequently, visible minority women suffer abuse in the home, and deviance in crime is as an effect of that abuse. Deviance in crime is a form of resisting abuse from a feminist perspective. Okay, now the last group we're going to look at is called postmodern. And the postmodern group has been um, influenced a lot by Michel Corsol and the work that he's done. His thesis. Prisons control the inmates, not by physical punishment, but by constant surveillance. It's called panopticon. Pena this is a structure that gives prison officials the po possibility to observe criminals at all times. So the, the evidence for this uh, panoptica, well, there are computers being used for surveillance over subordinates and companies. They can keystroke watch what you're typing in corporations, they have monitoring of that. Toilets that can monitor drug use. Nice, eh? License plates cameras. You go travel on the 407, you'll get a bill that tells you, we know you've been on the 407 and here's your bill for traveling on that road. Uh, closed circuit cameras in subways. The use of DNA. There is a lot of ways that um, postmodernists view that the way that crime is monitored is through technology. Okay, we've done a quick overview in part one of theories of criminal behavior. In part two, what we'll look at is looking at crime, who commits crime, and the Canadian justice system. Carry on the good fight. Bye now.